but they let it pass. It's certainly in foreign films. My first run-in was uh, on a film called uh, Yield to the Night with Diana Dawes. There was no sex in the film, nothing. It was done uh, tastefully and uh, that it uh, had a documentary flavor about it. Uh, it was certainly a favorite with the critics, but not with the censors. What the censors objected to was the whole premise, uh, not uh, any one particular scene. It was the whole premise of showing uh, the torment uh, of a woman in the death cell. I know about that door at the foot of my bed. It's through there that it happens, isn't it? They gave it an X certificate, and nothing would uh, budge them from that. And as you know, getting an X certificate in England, at least in those days, uh, meant that you reduced your audience by 85%. The film was shown twice in the House of Commons uh, during the capital punishment debate, and I, I like to think that it uh, did some uh, thing towards banishing the uh, death penalty in England. Obviously only very little, but the MPs were impressed by it. Um, I always regret that uh, that film had such a small audience because of uh, the censorship, which was ridiculous. In 1958, J. Lee Thompson went public with his grievances in an article which called for an independent committee for appeals against the censor. The industry thought it was a good idea. Uh, the censors saw their power and uh, their jobs possibly dwindling away that this board would become the censorship and uh, that it would be too lenient to the uh, film makers, so they uh, squashed the idea. But the board did see that it was time for a change in chief and promoted their most adept examiner, John Trevelyan. Trevelyan was a wily old diplomat with the face of a pornographer. He looked exactly like the man on the Dirty Mac. But in fact, he'd come from a very well-established uh, family that was in the diplomatic corps. His brother was an ambassador eventually in Moscow. And John had those talents to reconcile all the conflicting interests in the film industry. He was also very loquacious. He loved publicity. We have no rules, which I think is important. I think it's the only way to do it. You see, if you have your rules, you've either got to stick to them right through, or you've got to interpret them, and I think either's a foolish. So therefore, we try to assess what we believe are public attitudes at any one time, and to work on those. A British new wave of novels and plays which tackled sex and class were meeting critical and commercial success, and it became clear that the cinema would follow suit and embrace the new social realism. The censor cautiously allowed pretty explicit dialogue when John Brain's novel about a northern working-class lad courting the boss's daughter was made into a film. No! I'm sorry, Joe. Really, I am. Don't you like the way I make love? Oh, I like it very much. It reminds me of a good set of mixed tennis. Well, that's not a very kind thing I to say. I sometimes don't feel very kind. Why? We all... Mother and father, were they kind to me the other night? I can just see your mother now. Saying you mustn't see that vulgar Lambton boy again, or whatever his name is, the one with the bulging shirt and the chromium cufflinks. And then there's you. Will you leave me on so far, and then you stop me? What do you think I'm made of? It was a picture about the real people and real-life problems. When it came to us, we thought this was a good picture for the X category. 
Afterwards, critics congratulated us in the press on having the courage to pass it. So much so, I went in the office one day and said, we missed anything, and I really didn't see that we deserved congratulation. It was important also because it established the X category as what we always wanted to establish it as, and that is a category for a really adult picture, a serious adult picture. It had attracted a fair amount of trash before then. It really set the X category on its feet, and I'm always grateful to the picture for that. Encouraged by Room at the Top's reception, Trevelyan went on to argue against the board when it wanted to veto a film about homosexuality, still an illegal practice in 1961. It was really a, <coughs> only due to, to uh, Trevelyan going against his, his examiner's reports that we were able to make the film at all. What in through? Barrett? If I hear from you again, I shall inform the police. Do you understand? That's absolutely final. The incidents in it were very typical of what happened to uh, homosexuals whilst it was still the criminal offence. Homosexuals were perpetually uh, at the mercy of blackmailers. And so this was a very real problem, actually. I remember that one of the um, lawyers at rank uh, who read it for legal reasons, you know, for libel or whatever, read it through and sent, and the note that came back said that he saw nothing libelous in it at all, uh, but he wished he hadn't read it and he was now going to clean out his, wash out his mouth and wash his hands. So you can see what the attitude and the climate was in those days. I'm talking about 1960. It was regarded as uh, a film that push the limits of sexual candor somewhat further forward. That's to say that there was a personable and likable uh, hero played by a star, Dirk Bogard, who admitted on screen that he was a homosexual, although in fact the film contains no homosexual act at all. We felt very consciously that uh, if we were to show anything that was so highly sen sen censorable, uh, it would be difficult. And so that we thought it was better to leave the thing to People's, people's imagination, the audience's Im imagination. The film's discretion meant that only those in the know picked up the vital clues. Oh, don't bother to close it. I've got to go back to the clinic. Better to. victim, they didn't know what the hell I was. I mean, being queer in those days meant you had a cold or a bad stomach. I'm the born odd man out far, but I've never corrupted the normal. Why should I be forced to live outside the law? Because I find love in the only way I can. I did it on one condition with Basil, that I did write a scene between the husband and the wife where the man did say, yes, that he did love another man. Well, you can imagine what that to the Brack organization and everybody else. You were attracted to that boy as a man would be to a girl. Laura, Laura, don't go on. For God's sake, stop, stop now. I can't stop. I love you too much to stop. I thought you loved me. If you do, what did you feel for him? I have a right to know. All right, you want to know. I shall tell you. You won't be content until you know, will you? Till you ripped it out of me. I stopped seeing him because I wanted him. Do you understand? Because I wanted him! We did put, Dearden and Ralph did put the edge of the wedge in for what they've now, called, they now unfortunately call gay liberation or whatever it is. Trevelyan also guided another script tackling a taboo subject. Brian Forbes' film followed an unhappy French girl seeking a then illegal abortion in London. You had to submit a script in advance, and Trevelyan, who was then the censor, would give you a list of things you had to either shoot alternatives for or be very careful with. And Trevelyan would talk to you, would come down and watch it, a scene being shot if necessary. He came down to Shepperton, I recall, for the L-shaped room. It wasn't in any way a salacious scene. 
happened in those days, you always panned away to the gas fire at the moment of truth. And you leave much more to an audience's imagination and they can read into it several things. Those who get it, get it. Those who don't get it, I haven't lost the point of the scene because it's an emotional impact. But even so, it gave us trouble. And of course, poor Leslie Caron, in a very mild nude shot or top nude shot, had to have elastoplast over her nipples, I remember, which was very painful for her. Pathetic, really. I make you a promise. The first thing you'll hear when you wake up will be me telling you I love you. They were much more concerned with the abortion scene. When I say abortion scene, I wasn't shooting an abortion. I was shooting an abortionist. But in those days, of course, it was still a criminal offence, and so it was all full of innuendo. Uh, what stage are we at? Stage? Uh, how many months? Oh, uh, two and a half. Good. Now, next question. Uh, have you ever been pregnant before? <laughs> no. You're quite sure? Now's the time to say. I'm quite sure. Some of you girls aren't, you know. You'd be surprised how many colds go on for nine months and then weigh six and a half pounds. When we finally submitted the cut, and there were still problems, he said, well, I tell you what I'll do, I'll compromise with you. I'll bring in 30 or 40 secretaries and everybody off the street and give them a showing of the film. And nobody objected at all, and he passed it, which I thought was a very sort of enlightened way of approaching it. Society was changing uh, at an alarming rate during the 1960s and to some extent changing into a more libertarian society which assisted the censor uh, because he wished to diminish the onus of his own job by going along with what was regarded as socially acceptable in those days. By 1965, Trevelyan felt able to stretch the rules still further. If it was a work of artistic integrity, heading for a relatively limited release. A nightmare portrait of a young woman's descent into madness broke all the censor's taboos, including explicit female sexuality and graphic violence. The script by a Polish director making his British debut went back and forth between censor and filmmaker, and a friendship was born. <laughs> I uh, remember John Trevelyan very fondly. I, uh, I liked him very much. Uh, and I was under the impression that he liked me. I've made it uh, my business and my pleasure to getting to know filmmakers personally, filmmakers not only in this country, in the United States and in other countries. The more you get to know a filmmaker, the more you can assess his own personal integrity. I had an impression that uh, if uh, Trevelyan appreciates you as an artist, he would be more lenient. <laughs> Trevelyan, if he felt that some objectionable scenes were made entirely for the purpose of rendering the film more commercial, he would be he would be very tough with it, you know. He hated exploitation. Uh, but if he saw that scenes were not for the exploitation purpose, but for, uh, but they were the expression of, of, the, of the story itself, then he would be, uh, uh, he c you could discuss with him, you know, and you could, you could get through. Uh, um, uh. I'm extremely proud of the fact that I made the film in, 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 in which uh, uh, first sound of, of an orgasm received the certificate. Uh, 
every now and again we feel that a film can go out without comment because it's going into the art house circuit or the university circuit that we will pass it. It's a case of letting films out that would otherwise be stopped on the, on the national level. Little art movies that are destined for a few art houses um, have better chance of getting away with some sex or violence scenes that have, you know, pictures which have great commercial appeal. Indeed, Polanski's first American film did not come under the protective mantle of art cinema, and Trevelyan was not so lenient. You'd better have your legs tied down in case of convulsions. Yes, I suppose so. In Rosemary's Baby, uh, the things that would really make them crazy was any kind of combination of sex and violence. The scene in, in her dream, when she uh, dreams that she's raped by the devil, uh, surrounded by, by, by a coven of witches, and their legs are being tied, uh, tied to the bed with, uh, with sheets. This really made them crazy. Like they wanted me to cut this, uh, uh, this thing out, and I, I remember I fought to the last moment. But Polanski lost. These shots were cut on the film's British release in 1968. What happens to those sensors after they finish working? Uh, you know, when they, they go on the retirement or the, whether they go to a, uh, uh, to a mud house, because obviously having been exposed to all that filth throughout their lives, they should become very harmful uh, uh, individuals. I mean, harmful to the society. John Trevelyan was past retirement age in 1968 and was faced with new pressures. In Britain, theatre censorship had been abolished, and the board tried to move cautiously with the times. In Women in Love, John Trevelyan was very worried about the uh, nude wrestling scene. Um, naked men wrestling had never been seen on the screen before in the West. And he really fought very, very hard, I know. Letters were going forth, there were phone calls, secret meetings, and God knows what. But in the end, he got it through and he prevailed, and that was a huge step forward. In Argentina, the censor thought it was um, too strong, and um, so it only showed the men taking off their clothes before the wrestling in this firelit room. And the next shot was two men, naked from the waist up, lying in front of the fire, panting and saying, Too much for you? So this became known as the great buggery scene, and thousands went to see it, and of course it wasn't, it was just two men wrestling. So that's, that's how censorship can, can work in reverse. When Trevelyan felt an important film could not be certified without attracting controversy, he would suggest that it be shown in the private cinema clubs that were part of London's late 60s counterculture. If there wasn't an outcry and the critics supported the film, it could be certified later. The whole club operation really made it possible for him to indicate that a ban by him wasn't the last word, that there were other ways around. I care very much about the kind of film that the artist makes. Now, the artist may well be in advance of public attitudes, and uh, he may shock, but shock deliberately. I think this is fair enough. On one occasion, the club route for a controversial movie almost backfired. Artist Andy Warhol's film followed one day in the life of a street hustler and attracted an audience of 32 policemen. When Flesh opened, uh, it was in a place called The Open Space, which I think had previously not been a cinema club. Uh, it had only been run as a theatre. and. Um, Almost as soon as it opened, it was raided by the police. And the distributor of the film, Jimmy Vaughan, uh, 
very craftily rang John Trevelyan to advise him what had happened. I think Trevelyan had actually assisted in opening the club. Trevelyan put on his, uh, his uh, coat, uh, came down uh, to defend the right of the filmmaker in a private club to show this film. And then Trevelyan himself uh, called several journalists, myself included, to make sure that his case was well presented. And he protested loudly and publicly and made the headlines in every national and indeed quite a few of the international newspapers the next day. And the whole thing became an enormous scandal. Subsequently, the film got a lot more showings and went on to enjoy a lot of success. Oh, it looks so great wrapped up. Oh, it looks marvelous. That was terrible. It sure does. The raid was condemned in the House of Commons, who saw nothing pornographic in the film. Thus blessed, Trevelyan went on to give Flesh an X certificate in 1970. But trying out a Warner Brothers movie starring Mick Jagger in a members-only film club was not an option. This is a note from, a letter from the examiners. Title of film performance, August 1970. And this paragraph goes, the violence is some of the worst that we have ever seen. But quite apart from this and certain sex scenes, there's a vicious and depraved atmosphere and a very disturbing one about this whole picture. On the whole, the film is glossily <laughs> and well directed by Donald Cameron and Nick Rove, and the result is one of considerable impact. If this sick and vicious stuff is to get through in the new X, we feel that considerable cuts should be made, to say the very least. Performance drew on Camel's fascination with the dark glamour of London's gangland. Its mobsters bore a queasy resemblance to the Cray twins. A man of taste. Looks after his property, your owner, does he? Does he? I love the London underworld. I just wanted to show what these people were like, and what makes evil attractive or antisocial behavior attractive, was something that I just thought we can show that in a very simple way, and I tried to do that. The film's intercutting between a vicious beating and flashbacks to an earlier lovemaking scene were deemed unacceptable. Shall I? Shall I take right, Joy? No, I'll go. I'm not one of those. I'm not him. You love that, don't you? You little twerp. You vicious little crap! Say it! It went over the edge of what was not permitted. They were essentially images that you'd already seen in the first uh, reel of the film, where you see Chaz in bed with a girl uh, making love to him, intercut with him being beaten, right, sadistically by a guy who was obviously very close to him, where it was implied that, that he and the man who was beating him had been involved with each other. And uh, that was almost specifically stated, I think, in the film, or at least as close as we could get. Why don't you give him the kiss of life, Joe? You shut your filthy mouth! They would have been less problematic if they'd been, if sex and violence had been kept definitively separate. And, it, and when Trevelyan got his fangs into it, and I thought he was great, I rather liked him. But he said, you cannot mix up these things because the public can't deal with the points you're trying to make. That this may encourage them to think that we're all getting off on violence and sex and the uh, relationship between the two. Trevelyan, who was shocked by sex and violence and drugs and bisexuality, uh, didn't really know what to do about, about this because um, the cuts didn't seem to alter anything. Trevelyan himself felt he had to be reactionary because of his, you know, this old censorship thing of, well, we know that you're trying to be artistic and we know and we understand and you th we think you may have done it quite well, but we have to protect people from art. It's the idea of protecting people from art.
one of the most controversial scenes was shot in 16 mil uh, because um, we, we had the idea of going under the sheets. We shot this footage of three kids just getting it on and uh, having a, a, a love affair and laughing and giggling uh, in bed. But it was, they were all starkers, you know. They were all completely naked. And of course it was a lot of fun and very sexy and completely outrageous. So cutting that with uh, juridically for the census was a very difficult job. We left, uh, Tony left in as much as, as I dared, and that was far too much. Because of this, the basic thing of having sex on screen, full frontal nudity, John Trevelyan said, you better cut that out. And uh, anything that goes up into that area is due to be damaged. The footage would be great. It would make, uh, it would make the, f the film better, yes. It would make it wonderful if it was restored. Well, the year 1971 was a very, very disturbed year. Uh, not only in the cinema, it was the first year of Edward Heath's government. The Tories had come in on a law and order program, and all around them, law and order seemed to be breaking down. It was the year you remember of the trial of Oz magazine, and then the Little Red School Book, which was supposed to corrupt school children. And Lord Longford got in on a pornography game and uh, started to write his report on it. And in the middle of 1971, Ken Russell made the devils. And uh, although that was supposed to analyze the religious fever of the times, actually it seemed to be more indicative of the uh, abnormal interest that the film director took in the infliction of pain and sadism. There were so many things that um, were way over the top. The nun masturbating with a, with a bone, Christ getting off the cross and making love to, to a nun. When it came in originally, I thought, as most of us thought, that it was a reject. It went backwards and forwards with the additional cuts being added. Dear John, I have cleared up the shit on the altar, slashed the whipping and cut the orgy in two. This last has achieved several things. The sequence is now much more restrained, no longer self-indulgent and most important of all, the rape of Christ concept is strengthened and the idea that the true atonement for Christ's sacrifice is the mass, as said of later by Father Grandier, clarified. I hope you don't feel tempted to tamper with this sequence as it now stands. Hoping you agree. Yours, Ken. P.S. Please show this to Lord Harlock if you think it will have any bearing on his decision. I think it did. Eventually we reached a, a, a version that uh, Lord Harlock, the president, hadn't seen and neither had Frank Crofts, the senior examiner. We watched the film, the lights went up, uh, Lord Harlick turned to Frank and said, what do you think, Frank? And Fr Frank more or less said, surely we're not going to pass this. And uh, it was the only time any of us had ever seen Lord Harlick lose his temper. Uh, but he obviously felt, I, I, you know, he was a Catholic and he felt the film had a lot to say. I mean, it was a very graphic film and there was a, there was a, because, you see, religion was, the theme of the film, in a way, was the exploitation of religion. <laughs> Naked nuns, I mean, it, uh, it's enough to send England into a frenzy of rage. <laughs> I remember having a long talk with Don John Trevelyan about the torture scene. <laughs> and they, they did a particular torture, which is absolutely true, where they put your feet in a a boot, kind of a sort of metal boot, and then drive a wedge between your legs until the bones are crushed. The correspondence on that went on for weeks, and he'd, he'd I cut a bit out of it, of the hitting, and he'd say, well, it's, you know, it, it doesn't look much different to me. And I said, well, I've, I've cut half of it out. And he said, no, well, you cut some more out. And so I cut more, and, and in the end, there was hardly anything there. And he, he saw this hit, and he said, it's worse than ever. You've only, it, it's, it's the effect with just this one hit is terrible. Start putting some stuff back in. 
I exercise the immortal spirit in the name of Almighty God to depart from this man. <gasps> Uh, it was a matter of controversy because it was a religious film, and the religious organizations in the country are always very well organized when it comes to propaganda to oppose anything that seems to be blasphemous to them. So the local authorities up and down the country were getting all kinds of letters, many of them remarkably similar in tone and content and deed and phrasing, protesting against the film. <laughs> I think I thought about the devil as much as I've thought about many of the other things that have got through. That uh, it presents really not an aspect of freedom, but really an aspect of exploitation. And people, in one way or another, are going to suffer because of it, really. So we battled on right from then. <laughs> All this chaos was left on the incoming censor's desk. John Trevelyan retired in July 1971 when The Devils was released, leaving the outcry to his successor, Stephen Murphy, who in the next three years would also have to deal with Straw Dogs, A Clockwork Orange, Last Tango in Paris, and The Exorcist. But that's tomorrow night's story. A reminder that you can see James Fox and Mick Jagger in performance tonight here on BBC Two at 2.35. Thank <laughs> you.